Good morning and welcome back. Today I thought we would complete our two rivet heading tools. We've got a top rivet header that you hold in your hand, bottom rivet header that goes in the anvil, and these are sized for 3 8 rivets. We started this series by creating a ball tool that was nearly the right size and shape to make our rivet heads, and we used that for the rivet headers, then refined the depression in the heading tools with an actual rivet. So these are now ready to have any final cleanup, any grinding that needs to be done, filing, whatever needs to be done to make these just exactly the tool you want, and then it'll be time to harden and temper them. These really came out pretty good, but it's just a little bit rough right along the edges, and the inside of the depression is just a hair sharp, and that could snag a rivet or leave a funny line around the edge of your rivet. So I'm just going to flatten this up on the grinder real quick just to make it nice and smooth. And then we'll use a die grinder on the inside to clean up that little bit of a lip there. I just want to make sure this isn't too sharp of an edge in there. That's really all I feel like I need to do with that. Even once it's hardened and tempered, if it does leave a, a mark, I can come back and I can use the die grinder again. An actual ball burr would be better for this, but I don't have one that's quite that size. Put that on my next order. And what I'm not doing is grinding the impression here. If you have a perfect size ball that you can grind with, you could clean that up, but I, I think it's better off the way it's forged from the rivet head than it would be if I tried to use a die grinder on it. Today I thought we would go ahead and harden these tools using the coal forge, just to be a little bit different. I'm going to start with the handheld tool and I'm going to start by heating the back end up so I get a good even heat. Then we'll concentrate on the actual end that does the work. In the long run, we're not really going to harden the struck end. If it mushrooms a little bit, it's easy to file or grind or dress, and it won't be hard on your hammer. As with any hardening and tempering, it's important to bring pieces up to heat slowly and make sure it's hard all the way through. The outside can look orange before the inside is thoroughly hot. So you want to give it some soak time. As it gets some color, I'll turn the blower off and just let it sit on the coals. And while that comes up to heat, I'm also going to heat up a big bar that I can use to preheat my oil. It doesn't need to be red hot to heat the oil. I don't know if you can see this in the camera, but that's starting to come up to heat. You can also see it's not heating evenly, so I need to keep turning it around. I'm just going to let that soak in the fire for a little while. Then I'm going to take this out and put it in the oil. Remember, proper heat treatment starts when you make the tool. It is important as soon as you are through forging to bring the piece back up to the appropriate heat and either normalize or anneal, or maybe both depending on what the steel is. And the best way to find that out is to look it up somewhere. If you bought new steel, it might have come with heat treating instructions. If not, buying books or using cell phone apps, and we have talked about these things. So if you haven't seen some of those previous videos that talk about these resources, 
I will try to link to a playlist right up here, but you can also search for Black Bear Forge hardening, Black Bear Forge heat treatment, Black Bear Forge tempering, any of those search things in the YouTube search box that's right up here. And you should be able to find the videos that talk about all these resources for the information on heat treating. But since we've already done the normalizing or the annealing step on these tools, it's just down to hardening and tempering. Both of these steels are medium carbon steels, chrome moly steels, I, I believe. The one that's in the fire, the handheld tool, is a piece of sucker rod, so it's kind of an unknown. I don't know exactly what it is, but it behaves very similarly to 4140, so that's how we're going to harden and temper it today. And the bottom tool I know is 4140, that's a piece of new steel, so of course we will harden it like 4140 because that's what it is. In the video on making the ball tool, we hardened the end of the tool and left some heat in the body of the tool so it could bleed back forward and we watched the oxide colors run up to the end and that's how we tempered that tool. Today I think we're going to use a method that is a little bit more guaranteed to hit an exact temperature and probably a little bit more precise in that regard. So we're going to harden right here at the forge, but then we're going to put them in an oven to do the tempering and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But for right now, I'm going to get back to watching this tool come up to heat. I think that back end has soaked in well enough that we've got a nice even heat. And that even heat is important so that you don't have some sort of a line of demarcation in the tool where this is hot and this is cold and you quench the hot part and you, you can end up with a crack. They used to refer to it as a water crack or a water line. And we don't want that to happen, so the more evenly we can heat the tool, the better off we are. Now even though this other end comes up to heat much faster, you want to make sure you soak it in the fire and so that it's hot all the way through. The heavier the cross section of the tool, the more important that becomes. I'm going to go ahead and put this other tool in here, let it start coming up to heat. I don't want them both in there at the same time for most of the heating process because there's a risk of overheating the second tool while this one comes up to heat, but because this one is just almost exactly what I want, I think we're not going to have that risk too much. It's always a good idea to quench on a rising heat and into the oil. And we're going to work it up and down in the oil. This would be a good thing to do with a fan pointing outside. My shop is very well ventilated and my eaves are open so this escapes quite quickly and it rises up over my head so I don't have to breathe it. But be aware that you shouldn't breathe oil smoke no matter what kind of oil it is. And even though I'm mostly quenching just the end here, I'm working my way back up and ultimately I'm going to cool the whole thing because we aren't going to use these, we aren't going to use the residual heat to temper this with. So I want the whole thing cool enough that it isn't changing the property of the tool. But it isn't actually hardening the back end because it's cooled off below the hardening temperature. And you can still see the oil boiling a little bit so it's still plenty hot. And now it looks like the bubbles have quit, so. Looks like I need more oil. This is slowly wearing down and it's not quite as deep as I'd like it to be anymore. Now you should get your tool into temper as soon as you can after you quench it. The longer you wait, the more likely it is to crack just from the stress of hardening. And I'm just using a simple toaster oven. Toaster ovens are precise enough that they do a pretty good job, and if you're not sure about the temperature on it, you can buy a little oven thermometer that'll tell you what the temperature is inside, and that is more reliable than watching temper colors run. Plus, you can let it sit at the proper temperature for as long as you need to. Some, some steels actually call for two hours at tempering temperature, or they call for multiple tempering cycles. Just depends on how exact you really want to be. But this way I can go on and do something else. 
and I know that I'm going to get the right temper. In this case, I'm tempering to 450, partly because I know that that works with these steels. It's the temperature I use regularly, and partly because it's the highest this toaster oven will go. Frequently, I wish I could go to 500, and my kitchen oven will go to 500. But remember, I just hard this in oil, and putting it in the kitchen oven might stink up the house. So you better check with whoever does the cooking to see if you can use their oven. A little toaster oven usually runs off of any circuit you have in the shop. It doesn't need a special circuit like the household oven does. So they're really very convenient. You can find these at garage sales or secondhand stores quite often. For five or ten dollars, you might get yourself a nice little tempering oven. So they're awfully handy to have around. Because my shop is so well ventilated, the wind coming up outside is starting to blow smoke across the fire away from the chimney. But I think we'll be okay to harden this one. Now for this tool, if you don't heat it evenly, this is where it's going to crack. Or if you cool just the head of the tool and try to stop it right at the shank, your crack is going to be right here. So I want to make sure I get a good even heat through there so that doesn't happen. But as that starts to even out across that joint, I can turn it around. Okay, this tool is nice and evenly up to heat. I'm only going to harden the top portion of this so I don't quench that joint. Or perhaps I should say shoulder or transition or something. But again, I'm going to work up and down, around in circles, make sure there's no little air pockets forming. I'm hoping my hand isn't in your way there. I'm trying to do this left handed, feels uncoordinated. And ultimately, I'm going to quench the entire tool. Which, of course, gets rid of the flame and makes it smoky. And put it in the toaster oven. I do try to wipe any excess oil off before I put it in the toaster oven, just so it doesn't stink any more than it has to. Yeah. And it's not going to hurt that first tool to be in there a little longer. So I reset the timer for an hour. Now I don't even have to worry about them. Well, our matching set of rivet heading tools are completed. We have a bottom rivet setter that goes in the Pritchell hole. And it fits the rivet head quite nicely. And then we have a top rivet header that will do the head on the other side. That also fits quite nicely. So why don't we try these out. I think what I'll do is I'll rivet this set of tongs that we made during a tong making video many, many months ago. This particular set of flat jaw tongs was made with square bar and has forge welded on reins. So if you haven't seen that video, it's a good one to watch for traditional tong making methods. And I'll link to it right up here. This is one place the coal forge is really handy. I can just put this in the coal forge with the rivet down and it will heat much faster than the rest of the tongs. Darn near as convenient as using the torch. First thing I'm going to do is make sure everything is down tight with a monkey tool. Just good practice anytime you're setting a rivet. Then I'm going to make sure it can't fall out with a hammer before I go to the rivet setter. It's looking pretty good, but it's a little bit off-center, just because I managed to forge it off-center. So I'm going to heat it back up again and see if we can fix that. And I think the main reason that was off-center was because I've got it dropped a little bit to rest it on my thigh. So we'll work from the other side and see if we can counteract that. That looks a lot better. But this isn't a uh, video on how to set a rivet, so I'm not too disappointed. Mostly it's a chance to see if the rivet setter works. And that looks pretty good. That's not bad. I could have used just a hair more material for that rivet, but I think we're in good shape.
Well, making a pair of tongs really was not the intent for this video. That's just something that needed a rivet in it, so it was a good way to try out our rivet setter. And I am very happy with the way this pair of rivet setters function. Good tools, these will last a lifetime. Make them out of decent steel, you'll never have a problem with them. If you just need it for a temporary use, you're only going to do a few rivets at a certain size, you could make them out of mild steel. But if you're going to take the trouble, you might as well make them out of something like 4140 or even S7, which would be a really nice steel for this. But that might be a bit of overkill because I don't think they really need it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to watch some of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then take time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.